In this video, I'll be comparing Radeon to GeForce, this time in DCS World, uh, something that was requested by several of you in the last video. This will be focused on virtual reality and the results are not as intuitive as you might think. I have the same lineup of graphics cards as in my previous videos and we can see them on the left hand side, their amount of VRAM and which manufacturer they are from. I've also added in the current gen equivalent of this graphic of each graphics card. For example, I've often said the 3080 Ti represents the RTX 4070 family and the 4080 Super has been replaced by a 5080, although you'll be lucky to find one. All the testing was performed with a stationary valve index as shown here. I tested at a low resolution with the OpenXR toolkit when available. Fixed foveated rendering is enabled with performance mode at wide, but motion smoothing is disabled. I don't want the results to be super skewed by frame generation, which uh, I guess it's all over the headlines lately with RTX 50 series. There's also a mix match of drivers and versions of DCS. I'll explain that later, but in the performance charts, I'll never compare uh, A to B. It'll always be A to A. I'm using the same graphic settings as my last video, and you can check out those CPU results here where I go into an in-depth explanation. And I also did a side-by-side -side, uh, with those CPUs, and you can see that video here as well. Okay, so let's jump into the first comparison where I'm gonna take the 4080 Super and compare it to the 3080 Ti on the 9800X3D platform that I have. These are the results I captured earlier in January when DCS was at version 2911. And we can see the distribution of frame times at the bottom of the screen. Again, we want everything to be to the left of the yellow dashed line because this is a 90 Hertz test. If the GPU frame time slips past that 90 Hertz line, it's going to incur a penalty. That could be asynchronous warp if you have that enabled, or it could be motion smoothing uh, in the case of Steam VR. We can see the real time stats scrolling across the screen featured from FPS VR, an app you can get in the Steam store. And you notice that there were delays from the 3080 Ti as we swooped down lower to the buildings and all of those assets had to be drawn in VR. The 4080 Super did not struggle there. What you saw on screen just then was represented here in this frame time chart as slipping past that 11.1 .1 millisecond line. In the case of Steam VR, asynchronous reprojection is always enabled unless you go into FPS VR and disable it in the advanced settings. I don't recommend doing this. I don't benchmark with it off because it's a jittery mess, it affects the data, and I don't think it represents a real user experience. I'll show some examples of this later with the 7900 XTX towards the end of the video. For now, let's switch to the 3060 Ti. We know from the blue line in the frame time chart that at this resolution and with these DCS settings, this graphics card cannot deliver 90 Hertz. It's not even close. It's always going to be in reprojection mode at 45 FPS. After reading user comments and seeing other videos such as the opinion from VR Flight Sim Guy, a great resource by the way, a lot of people would rather trade image quality to have a crisper image and just accept the fact that they're stuck at half the frame rate of their Hertz. So in this case, it's 45. If you're at 80 Hertz, it would be 40 FPS and so on. It boils down to your preference and what your hardware is capable of. All right, so if we flip over to the 2070 Super, I guess we shouldn't be surprised that it is also heavily reprojecting. Checking out the light blue line in the frame time chart, we can see that it has totally shifted even more so to the right. This means that there's even less room for the 2070 Super to deliver its frame times and then even miss the 22.2 millisecond requirement of reprojection. In fact, I might as well just add that into the chart. Any frame times delivered past 22.2 milliseconds or an FPS less than 45 FPS is going to be a really bad stutter in the headset. In the case of the 2070 Super, it even had some data points over 30 milliseconds long. That's the maximum value that FPS VR tracks. This is all to say that even with the crutch of reprojection at 45 FPS, the 2070 Super is not delivering a consistent experience. 
the resolution is too high in the Valve Index, and the DCS graphics settings are just too demanding for this video card. Okay, so I want to talk about Radeon in VR with DCS, but there's an important distinction. Radeon does not support fixed foveated rendering, at least not how it's implemented through the OpenXR toolkit. So if I remove the side-by-side -side comparison and we just look at the 4080 Super, look at the outer ring of the image and you can see that it's less, there's just less fidelity, there's less clarity. That's because it's being told by the software to render at a lower resolution, I guess. This reduces the GPU workload a little bit and allows the image to be rendered a bit more easily but it's unfair for me to compare Radeon to GeForce if GeForce has this enabled, isn't it? Because they would just always have an advantage. So in order to look at this, I decided to go uh, back to the 3080 Ti and play around with a few more benches. These results are taken with the latest DCS, uh, version 2.9.12. I'm on the newest NVIDIA drivers, um, and we're comparing five different data sets. Purple is what we have been looking at, which was fixed foveated rendering on DLSS balanced with the 3080 Ti. We see that compared to the right-hand side, which has foveated rendering off and a deployment of NIS at 0.66. This stands for NVIDIA Image Scaler and it works on non-RTX cards. It could even work on Radeon cards because it's non-proprietary. It doesn't require the game to actually support it. It's like the granddaddy to DLSS. In my frame time analysis, with it set to 0.66, it actually produced better results than DLSS balanced. If we turn off image scaling and we just go with the native resolution, and we run uh, TAA for anti-aliasing. I know it's not MSAA, please forgive me. I'll change that for next time. Regardless, we can see the impact to our FPS. This is an undesirable experience because it's just going between 90, 45, and a whole bunch of values in between. This is not pleasant to experience. I'm sure the image quality is better. I'm sure the latency would be better, but not like this. Going back to the frame time chart, we see the yellow line that represents DLSS balanced with fixed foveated rendering off. There's just a subtle kick to the right. This means frame times have increased, performance has diminished. And we even have some yellow data points to the right of our 90 Hertz timeline. And the last data set is red. That's with foveated rendering off and we're running at native resolution. Th this was also not a smooth or pleasant experience. A reminder that this side-by-side -side footage is the DCS window of the VR feed. It's not from the headset. And it, it, I don't know, I think you can see some of the stuttering, but really it just shows up in the data better. Using these new data points, let's compare the 3080 Ti to the 7900 XTX. Why not the 4080 Super? Well, mine is out for RMA. I should have it back next week. As far as I understand, since DCS 2.9, you don't need any other software to get this to work on Radeon. I just went in, selected NIS, and these are the results. The side-by-side -side is comparing yellow to red. That is the uh, 7900 XTX with NIS versus native, while the frame time chart includes the 3080 Ti, again, at those same settings too for an A to A like for like test. At this resolution, we're not seeing any issue with VRAM usage, so there is no advantage to the 24 gigs here. This is just the straight up rasterization performance, I guess. The 7900 has a clear advantage. If you've been watching the real-time data, you might notice that the native performance for the 7900 XTX doesn't look as good as the frame time chart suggests. This is an influence of reprojection or inserting a fake frame. That's what the second clump of data is down here. It's using the queue of previously rendered frames with your new head position and kind of warping them into the flow so it doesn't hiccup. Notice how that doesn't exist for the yellow line representing the NIS performance. So to get the full picture, let's bring in another chart. Oh my God, there's so much on the screen right now. So we have three new bars. One is the average FPS in gray. So at 
NIS scaling 0.66, it's 90 frames per second, whereas at native, we're at 72.5. Then I have a green number. This is the uh, on-time percentage as reported by FPS VR. Again, this can be misleading just by itself because a reprojected frame can technically be on time. So that's why we need to see this next part, which is represented by the third bar in each stack. And that is showing the reprojection ratio. This has been accumulating in the live data that has been going on with the screen. Right now we're at 17% for the red 7900 XTX and climbing. We have to look at all this data to understand the performance. It, it just takes this many metrics. It's why you can't evaluate how fast a car is by how much horsepower it has or I guess in this case, a, uh, a jet by its thrust. All right, I got one, <laughs> one more set of data. I'm sorry, I can't stop. And uh, this is just with the 7900XTX. I'm gonna have the data off here to the side and just be showing you one feed at a time. I'm gonna give your eyes a break. If we don't run motion smoothing, no asynchronous reprojection, we're just running essentially the, the, the legacy projection model, which is if, you, if a frame is late, it gets dropped and we see this in the feed on the right hand side those are hard hitches in the headset it's terrible unfortunately it just doesn't come across with the video capture card uh it just glazes over it but we can see in fps vr that 15 frames were dropped and if you didn't blink you would have seen them all if we flick on motion smoothing, I mean, we're already restricted to 45 FPS before we even swoop down to that town. And notice in the frame time chart that the um, latency has increased with motion smoothing. And that's because of the uh, in interpolation that's happening where it's trying to use previous frames to create a new one. That always creates latency. The same thing's happening with DLSS 4 with uh, the new graphics cards. So I, I have some questions for you guys. What, how, how do you want me to go through and do the graphic card benchmarking? I can just do what I've been doing, which is picking settings that I think are reasonable request of most of the hardware I have. And if the video card can't keep up, well, I'll just show that it can't. Or do you wanna see the performance normalized? So I would just, for example, with a 3060 Ti, reduce the resolution until it's able to deliver that consistent 90 FPS that it's required for 90 Hertz. But I have no idea how many of you are actually just leaning into motion smoothing. Um, maybe it's the majority of you, I, I, I'm not sure. There's a lot of personal preference when it comes to how do you tune and run your own VR experience and what some of us tolerate, other, others of us can't. Um, and so I can't do them all, uh, <laughs> I don't have enough time. So how about I'll do some YouTube polls, make sure you subscribe and I want your feedback. I'm gonna let you guys choose which direction I go. And when I get my 4080 Super back, hopefully it is working properly. And then I'll revisit DCS um, with an updated track file and with the analysis that you guys want to see. Meanwhile, if you have any questions or would like to point out my mistakes, use the comments below. And if you would like to support what I do, uh, please do that through Patreon.